who got out and saw the partial eclipse? Really? Like three people? Wow. Four? All right. It was kind of cool. Anybody watching the coverage on the total eclipse? It was pretty, it was pretty spectacular. There was a bunch of proposals, people getting married. <clears throat> I thought the coolest location was actually Vermont. It was at the top of a ski resort in Vermont, the highest point in Vermont. And uh, I don't know, it was, pre it was pretty wild to see it sunny. And then the moon came in front of the sun and went dark and somebody got down on a knee and there was a proposal. And yeah, it was cool. It's cool. CNN streamed it. It was pretty, pretty fascinating. So I think uh, in the pathway, it's like 20 years from now, in those, in the next total solar eclipse, you all will be old. Yeah, 20 years. Now, you, you can catch them in different locations. You just have to travel to them. But if you wanted to get that same pathway, <clears throat> and we didn't have a total eclipse here. We were too far, too far west. So those of you in Arizona or northern Arizona, did you guys see the eclipse in 17, 2017? I think it was a little bit bigger here than it was today, but it was still cool. Okay, a <clears throat> couple of announcements. Um, so the study guide, the study guide is already posted. I posted that today. Uh, there'll be some accessory materials that we'll probably post, what we always do. The guidance on the study guide is, again, it's to reinforce, it's not to replace. So if you just study that and nothing else, I, I don't think that's a good move. I think it's, you know, kind of checking to see if you're missing anything. <clears throat> this week, you've got quiz 12 due this Friday. Okay? Quiz 12 is on muscle physiology. That's what we're going to be doing this week and Monday. And then what's happening next Wednesday? Exam, Exam 4. That's right. You're going to want to stay all the way through the end of class today. Those of you that came, yes, I saw a couple flexes like it. And, um, and again, we do participation, we do bonus. The bonus you're not going to want to miss. Okay, The bonus is going to be worth... 20 points. It's going to be a paper on uh, muscular dystrophy, which we'll talk a little bit about today. Okay, everyone see my announcement on Canvas? I'm not a Canvas expert, but I know a lot more now than I did when we started the semester. Not that user friendly for old people like me that like BB Learn and we're very familiar with it but I think we kind of got it figured out. So what will happen <clears throat> when we offer the bonus opportunity, it will get off again. And then after the grades are done for exam four, we can reset it like it is right now. It's correct and accurate right now. And I've manually checked it. I've exported to Excel. I did Excel calculations. I did manual calculations to make sure your grades right now are accurate, so you have an accurate picture of where you are in the semester. I'll have expanded office hours this week, tomorrow 1 to 2, in person or by Zoom. Wednesday, 1.30 to 3.30, in person or by Zoom. Okay? So if you want to come see me, see your exams, talk about your grade. Last week on Wednesday was really busy, but I think I got through everybody. So, you know, hopefully... Just, you have to have a little patience. Any other housekeeping things? Okay, let's get into it. Why was six afraid of seven? Because seven, eight, nine. Like it. Where do cats wait to pay their bills? Where do they wait to pay their bills? In the feline. Okay, all right. All right, I got some giggles. I think that was, that was just being polite. I appreciate that, ladies. Why are animals in the ocean so healthy? Why are animals in the ocean so healthy? They get their daily dose of vitamin C. 
I feel like you need one more. What do you call a person who doesn't toot in public? A private tutor. <laughs> so, I got one fan. I love it. Come see me after you've aced the class. You got an A all semester. I love it. Just kidding. You can use that one. The private tutor is good. You just have to know your audience. I pulled that one out a few times in the wrong audience. My wife's like, seriously, honey? So we're, insert transition. We're talking about muscle physiology. <clears throat> this is, I think, one of the most fascinating parts of the semester. Notice I didn't say it's the most difficult. I actually think it's the most fascinating. And I think if you lean into this unit with 20 extra uh, bonus opportunities, uh, 20 extra uh, points and bonus, and understand this material and think through it like, how would I use it in my next phase of life? Like the next professional thing that you want to do. Has anybody ever seen these exhibits? These human exhibits, these dissections, they're, they're pretty elegant. If you do, I highly recommend it. Some, every now and then, they'll do these real body exhibits in Phoenix. Uh, they're usually in big cities. The last one I saw was in New York City. Um, I've seen it in London. Uh, they're, they're, they're pretty spectacular. So they're full dissections of the human body, and they're usually posed, like, like what you see in the upper left. But we have been studying the human body, particularly muscles, for a long time. And we'll talk today about the, some of the root words and as we get into the infinite detail of the muscle, we're going to talk a lot about anatomy, different anatomy than what you do in lab. And I know your muscle lab was a while back, right? It was a while back, but the muscle lab was pointing and identifying. And then what does it do and how does it move? And some of that, we're going to warm up with that so you'll already know that because it was like the you know, first part of the semester in lab when you studied muscles. But we're going to get into the real physiology of how they work. We're going to talk about things like sliding filament model. We'll talk about actin and myosin. We'll talk about muscle contraction. We'll talk about calcium cycling. We'll talk about relaxation. And of course, everything only happens from a muscle standpoint if you send an electrical signal to it. If we call that electrical signal what? An action potential, okay? Muscles make up nearly half of the body's weight. They're extremely heavy. Now, that also means that it's rather inefficient for locomotion to have something that's baggage that you're carrying around. Actually, muscle is heavier than adipose tissue. Muscle is heavier than fat. And if you move on and you do body composition of elite athletes or of individuals, of patients, um, you'll start to understand muscle weighs about four times as much as fat tissue. We call muscle lean body mass, and it's heavily full of water. It's highly hydrated, whereas fat tissue is hydrophobic and it repels water. So it's a very efficient way to store energy with, a lot of, with not a lot of weight. So here you have a lot of weight, oops, excuse me. Here you have a lot of weight because the trade-off is the functionality of the muscle, okay? There's, only, there's over 600 skeletal muscles in the body, depending upon you, how you separate them out. Some textbooks say 650. So I would say over 600, you're probably safe. Most of these muscles are found in pairs as you studied in the lab, right? Pairs because there's, we're, we're bilateral creatures. Muscles are voluntary and they require conscious stimulation, specifically skeletal muscle. Next week on Monday, as we wrap up, we'll talk about smooth and cardiac, which we've been talking about, but we'll get into the microarchitecture. We'll talk about how they work. We're gonna be spending today and Wednesday and part of Monday talking about skeletal muscle. So these are voluntary, conscious stimulation. Motor efferent nerves originating from what part of the brain? 
motor efferent nerves. You're like, oh, uh, mine's not working so well right now, my brain. Motor efferent nerves. It's the precentral gyrus, that's right. It's in the frontal lobe, right, towards the anterior aspect. The functions. Here's a great simple test question. What are the, which of the following is not a function of muscle? Or which of the following is a function of muscle? And then, of course, Dr. Keller is going to put two of those on the list. So if you don't read, read the full question, you'll see one that you recognize and you fail to see the second one. Does that sound familiar? So let's study the whole list of muscle function. Movement. Enable us to go from one place to another. That's called locomotion. Stability, maintaining posture. Control of body openings. Passages, muscles around the mouth, eye, urethra, and the anus for the elimination of waste. And this is under conscious control, as we studied with the maturition reflex. Right? Usually the external sphincters for waste elimination are under conscious control. That's the part that potty trains. And the internal sphincters are under parasympathetic control, which is subconscious or not voluntary. Now, muscles also is a fourth one, which is a little unusual, but you'll think about an example since you're here in Flagstaff now, and it's been a decent winter. How do we actually generate heat with muscles? Any ideas? A couple different ways. I'm just, yeah? Shivering. So if you're extremely cold, you'll start to shiver. Your shiver response, everybody think, like, why do I do that? Well, you're actually contracting muscles quickly. It's kind of like the Mr. Miyagi, right, where you generate heat. Because I want you to think about that when we talk about actinomycin. You've got filaments that are sliding across each other, just like, and they go quickly. They cycle really fast. So when a muscle contracts, it generates heat. Now. Those of you that exercise in Flagstaff, right? It's classic, classic uh, mountain town full of crazy athletes, right? People altitude train here. Never fails. I'm driving to the mountain, right, to, to enjoy the snow. Um, and, you know, I've got skis or snowboards on the back in the rack. And I drive by some dude with a beard about like this in shorts that are probably illegal, about like this, with really bright shoes, right, and legs where I can see every striation, and he's just cruising down Fort Valley Road, running. Well, his legs aren't cold because of why. When your muscles contract, they generate heat. Lots of heat production. So the shiver response is totally accurate, but even in a non-shiver, even in a contraction, your muscles are warm. And you know that after you work out, after you exercise, especially here in Flagstaff. So 85% of our body heat is generated from muscle contraction. And this is really important for homeostasis, like maintaining our metabolic function and activity because you need enzymes to be at a certain temperature level for them to work, right? How do, you, how do you slow down enzymatic degradation of, say, food products? What do you do? What do you do with your leftovers when you get home? You leave them on the counter? You put them in the fridge. Or you buy too much hamburger meat, right? You have an apartment, you're not on campus. Where do you store it for next week? In the freezer. So if you slow down enzymatic activity by lowering temperature, right? In our laboratory, we have very cold temperature devices, like a minus 20 Celsius freezer, a minus 80 Celsius freezer, and then liquid phase or vapor phase liquid nitrogen, which is like minus 276 Celsius. So you store things there where you want nothing to degrade. So in my house, I'm like the king of nothing goes bad in the freezer because I have lots of freezers in the lab. And my wife hates that statement. It's not true, but don't tell her, don't let her watch this. I didn't admit to anything. Did you have a question over here? Yeah. 
Great question. So when you're, uh, when you're exercising, you're creating all that heat. Is that why we sweat, to cool yourself off? Yeah. So you need to maintain a homeostatic core temperature that's not too hot. So you have functions to cool yourself off, and that's why you sweat. And evaporative heat loss is one of the most um, efficient ways to lose um, heat, kilojoules of heat of, from evaporation. That's one of the reasons, like, if you're exercising, you're running outside in a humid environment and you're sweating, it's much more uncomfortable than if you're running outside in a dry environment. Because when the sweat hits the skin and it evaporates off, it takes the heat with it. But when there's a high humidity, you don't get a lot of evaporative heat loss. The sweat stays on the skin. Okay? But that's two, those are two feedback mechanisms uh, to keep our enzymatic function and our metabolism dialed in. Okay, <clears throat> now muscles, the point of them. If you go to any of these exhibits, these body exhibits, where they've dissected all these um, men and fem uh, women and they display them, Kind of, and, and they're not just displayed like in anatomical position. They're like swinging a baseball bat. So you're like, you're seeing the muscles in the position of swinging a bat. Or, you know, they're rolling a bowling ball. And so it's like a cadaver, like in a rolling the bowling ball position, which is weird, but it's kind of cool because you get to actually see how the muscles work in that particular motion. So the idea here is, Almost every single skeletal muscle in the body crosses at least one joint. Because as it contracts, it puts a force on that joint to allow motion to take place. Now, in lab, you talked about origin insertions. So we're going to simply just say this. They have to have two attachment points. They have an origin that doesn't move during the contraction. They have an insertion that does move during the contraction. Now, some positions and some motions, you can actually flip those. You can flip the origin and the insertion. So we're not going to test you on, you know, this muscle, what's its origin, what's its insertion, like you had in lab. I just want you to be familiar with the concept that the origin is, not the, is the part that doesn't move. That's where the muscle is to originate from. And the insertion is where it's pulling, and it's either pushing it forward or it's pushing it away. Each muscle has at least one action. And the muscle's contraction usually moves the insertion closer to the origin. That's the whole concept. And I'll show you a couple of examples here. Now, innervation. This word, what does that word mean, innervation? Any ideas, any guesses what innervation means? When we say that a muscle is innervated, It had nerves that actually synapse onto the muscle. So specific nerves that synapse onto the muscle would control that particular muscle. So in that theme, we've got the prime muscle or the prime mover that executes the action. We have muscles that support it. Those are known as synergists. And then we have muscles that antagonize it or, or antagonist, go opposite to that. So the prime mover, bless you, prime mover is responsible for that movement. Synergists actually support that movement. And then muscles that have opposite actions are known as antagonists. So let's give an example. And, and some of this I know is overlap from a few weeks back early in the semester with lab. Um, it, but this is just kind of warming us up because we're going to dive next into the anatomy of the muscle. Not the anatomy of the muscle of like, oh yeah, I forgot, that's the biceps brachii, that's the brachialis, and that's the triceps. Right? This is the patient's right arm, here's the elbow. This should be familiar. So the prime mover, the biceps brachii, flexes the forearm, right? It decreases this angle. The brachialis is a synergist. It's just deep to the, bra uh, the biceps brachii. And then the triceps brachii is the opposite or the antagonist, which actually extends the elbow. Make sense? Okay. 
We all pretty clear just on muscle architecture. This is kind of where we deviate from lab. And we're going to start talking a little bit more about muscle cell anatomy. Now, before you freak out, I want you just to look at this as a traditional cell. Yes, it looks different, but it is just a traditional cell. It's just organized in a special way, right? All of us are humans, but we all are unique. But we all have the same parts. So this is a cell. It is unique. It all has all the same parts as a regular cell. OK? So don't flip out too much. But it is organized in a very specific way because structure helps to influence how it functions. The cell is shown way down here as a fiber. A muscle fiber is the same thing as a muscle cell. A muscle fiber is the same thing as a muscle cell. And then around this muscle fiber, we actually surround it with an endomycium. An endomycium. That's the thin layer of loose connective tissue, if you remember back to the very beginning of the semester, that surrounds each muscle fiber. You get a number of muscle fibers together in a grouping, and you surround them with another layer of thicker connective tissue, still loose connective tissue in nature. And that sheath wraps the muscle fibers together in bundles known as muscle fascicles. Then you see this blow up diagram? Then we take a bunch of these muscle fascicles together, and we package them and surround them with what we call an epimyceum. I should have said the perimyceum is around the muscle fascicle, and then all these, so that's the perimyceum right here, which goes right over top of this, and then you put all these bundles together, and then you surround it with an epimyceum, which is this outer covering, which is the same as this. That little box is this box blown up. Endomycium around the muscle fiber. A bunch of muscle fibers together, a muscle fascicle. Around the muscle fascicle is the perimyceum. You put a bunch of fascicles together inside the muscle body itself and surround it with a connective tissue sheath known as the epimyceum. Now, what does this motif remind you of? Any other structures that we've studied this semester? Nerve, fascicles, nerve bundles, anything else? The bone, very good. So do you remember me telling you when we looked at bone, this was like early of the semester, I said, hey, you're going to see these motifs again and again. I mean, biology will stick to something if it's working organizationally. Now, we talked about the functions of muscles. Now let's talk about their characteristics. That's different than how they function. Characteristics. They're excitable. They're responsive to stimuli. But excitable means something very specific, meaning that they can be electrically stimulated. They're conductive. That means that you can send a signal of electricity down them like a nerve. So the electrical signal that comes from a nerve then innervates onto a muscle, travels down the muscle as an action potential, just like it did with the nerve. That's conductive. Are nerves conductive? Are nerves conductive? Yes, not a trick question. Nerves are conductive, so are, so are muscles. Muscles are responsive, meaning they can be excitable to that electrical signal. But do you see how those are two different concepts or two different characteristics? 
having excitable tissue and having tissue that can actually send the signal electrically downstream. Now they can start doing things that are very different than nerves. They can contract. They can create a force. They can produce a local effect as a result of that electrical signal that came from the premotor cortex. This is how you interact with your environment. They're extensible. They can be stretched or extended. That's good, because what happens if I fire it too aggressively? I want to have some flexibility here. And then, isn't it great that you're not one and done? Like, what do you mean? Well, they're elastic. So they're extensible and they're elastic, so they can go back to their resting state. Because it would kind of suck if you're like, I can only fire my muscles once, so I really have an itch. Bam. I have another itch. Well, that one's over, right? So you can fire it, itch, fire it, itch, right? Fire, itch. You can brush your teeth. You can cut your food. You can eat your cereal. You can drink your milk, right? You can do these activities over and over again because you've got extensibility and elasticity and you have the ability for the muscle to reset itself. Really important. All right, now let's dive into the muscle fiber itself. What's another name for the muscle fiber? The muscle cell. So where are we? We're all the way down here, the bottom right, that individual muscle fiber, we're blowing up, and it looks like this. Do you see where we are? We've kind of zoomed in. This is, this is all new material. So I'm going to encourage you to, like I'll, I'll, I'll say it again at the end of the lecture, of what I want you to pre-study for Wednesday, okay? So if this is becoming really confusing to you, take a look in the textbook. It does a pretty good job. Look back at the lectures. Come to SI, come to TA sessions, come see me in office hours. We, you, I really need you to understand where you are, like how far you've zoomed in. Okay, so back up. Here's our muscle fiber. That's this whole thing. You see this circle is around the muscle cell, otherwise known as the muscle fiber. It has a plasma membrane because it's a cell, right? The plasma membrane has a fancy word called the sarcolemma. Sarcolemma is the plasma membrane for a muscle cell. The sarcoplasm, what do you think that word refers to in a normal cell? Sarcoplasm is what? The cytoplasm. Okay, do you see this right here? This is a nucleus. Here's one that's kind of beneath the surface. This reminds me of like when my kids were younger, they would hide in my bed and I'd see these like bumps. I, I have to digress the story. They got me one time because I would like come in and you know, you just pretend you're silly, you pretend and you pretend like you're gonna go to sleep and fall on them, right? Because kids are plastic. Kids are extensible and elastic. They are excitable as well. Um, they are conductive, but you have to be careful here. Um, so a lot of these terms actually apply to children, just so you know. But anyways, so this reminds me of when they were little. So they, uh, my two youngest thought it would be fun. They, they, the bed was made, and they put pillows in the bed. They were just about the right size of them. And I full send onto the bed, and then they come out from behind, you know, the closet doors just laughing their head off. But that's what I think of when I see these nuclei. So it's multinucleated. You remember skeletal muscle is multinucleated. You remember when we studied that with the histology? So multinucleated cell. What else to convince you that we have a cell? What else do you see that's a characteristic or an organelle of a normal cell? Sar what is it? Sarcoplasmic reticulum. What else? Organelles. What do you see? Mitochondria. You see the mitochondria here? All of these are mitochondria. What else? This A band, Z band, 
eye band crap, you've never seen it before. You're right. Like, I have no idea what that is. We'll get there. What about these myofibrils? What about these myofibrils? You see them in a regular cell. They're just not this plentiful, and they're not, this, they're not organized in this way. But these are made up of myofilaments known as actin and myosin, and we'll study those. We'll study those today, and then we'll use them on Wednesday. Because the actin and the myosin, that's this. They slide across each other, and as they slide across each other and the Z lines get closer and closer together, the sarcoma gets closer and closer together because they overlap, that's the muscle contracting. When the muscle relaxes, those filaments slide back the other direction. Okay, so we'll talk about that. But you find actin and myosin to some extent, definitely actin, in every, muscle, every cell in the body. Actin is part of the cytoskeleton. They just are organized and very plentiful within a muscle cell. So hopefully I've convinced you that we're looking at just a regular old cell. But it is specialized. You with me? All right, so let's get down to the actin and the myosin, the myofilaments. That's what we're seeing right here. We've got a thick filament that is mostly myosin, and then we have a thin filament, which is mostly actin. So the thick filament that's found in purple is mostly myosin. The thin filament in this orange color or this, you know, rust color is mostly actin. Now, the thick filament, the middle of the thick filament where all the thick filaments are anchored is um, in this region we call the H band. And this is the M line right down the center. The thin filaments are anchored within this region known as the I band. And this particular structure, which is not a, a line down the middle, it's a zigzag or a Z line, also known as the Z disc. So the Z disc anchors the actin or the thin filament, and the M line anchors the thick filament. And so you can appreciate those two can slide across each other. Do you see that? There's a little bit of space right here and there's a little bit of space right here. And that's how muscles contract. And we'll, we'll get into more detail, but I'm trying to you know, slowly zoom you in. So if you remember back to the histology, we said that skeletal muscle was not only multinucleated, but it was striated. So where did the striation patterns come from skeletal muscle? It comes <clears throat> from this specific organization of thick and thin filaments and these regions that you can see up here, this I band is a region that's occupied by thin filament, but no thick filament. This I band is a lighter color. Here's the other I band. The thick filament occupies this region known as the A band from here to here. And the, there's areas of the A band that are slightly darker where you've got more crossover, right? Here you have less crossover. So the H band in the middle, where there's no thin filament, is going to be slightly lighter than the A band, where you've got thick and thin overlap. That gives you that striated pattern. So these I band, H band, A band, they're just areas that we describe or define based upon the microanatomy. Oops. <clears throat> okay, so we talked about the A band. The A band occupies this area of the thick filament. The H band is within the A band where there's only thick and no thick and thin. The M line is right down the center. We talked about that. And then the definition of a sarcomere is from Z disc to Z disc. Sarcomere, Z-disc to Z-disc. The sarcomere is referred to as the functional unit of muscle. 
This area, that sarcomere, is referred to as the functional unit of muscle. <clears throat> and it's a Greek term, which I, I think is quite fascinating. I mean, a lot of the muscle terminology are either Greek or Latin words. I mean, most of this class is Greek or Latin. So the sarcomere comes from the Greek sarx, miros. So sarcomere, sarx means flesh. Miros means part. So it's a flesh part is how it literally translates in Greek. Functional unit of muscle. All right, so we're going to use this. We're going to use this motif as we study today as well as Wednesday because actin and myosin, mostly the thick filament is myosin, and mostly the thin filament is actin. Now, it's not necessarily totally correct to say thick filament equals myosin and thin filament equals actin. But generally speaking, that generalization is okay. I'll get, you into, I'll get into more of the weeds as to what other parts are part of the thick filament and the thin filament. But myosin and actin, these two cytoskeletal proteins that are found in all cells, they function in cell motility, mitosis, transport of intracellular material. Here in skeletal as well as in cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle is organized in a very similar fashion. They function for sliding or contraction. So here is our striations. Here's our multinucleated cells. You see these nuclei? This is a scanning electron micrograph that's been pseudo-colored or colored enhanced so you can appreciate certain features of the cell. So this is the muscle fiber that's highlighted in blue. Here when highlighted in, in this sort of aqua blue is the A band. Here we've got the I band. And here you have the nuclei. Now, I'm not going to show any pictures of these, um, these SEM pictures. I'm just trying to help you identify what you're looking for, OK? But like, you know how I have the, the five floating pictures on the exam? I wouldn't focus on these. I'd focus on other pictures. Don't focus on these SEMs. I'd focus on this, this structure I'd focus on for those five floating pictures. When we look at these striations, we've got the A band. A is used because it comes from the terminology of uh, anisotropic. Anisotropic is a word that means directionally dependent. It has a property of being directionally dependent. So there's a part of the A band, like we talked about, where the thick and the thin filaments overlap. And that is especially dark right in here. There's a part of the uh, A band where there's thick filaments only, and that is a little bit lighter. And we saw, we saw that. We talked about the M line, which is right down the middle of the A band, as well as the H band. <clears throat> and the I band, the I band that's occupied only by thin filament, which is this rust orange, and no thick, that I band stands for isotropic, means identical properties in all directions. So, that, so these terminologies of characteristics of these regions is where we got their A and their I nomenclature from. The Z disk provides that anchoring uh, portion or anchoring port for the thin filament, which is the rust colored filament, as well as this kind of looks like a corkscrew, this green filament known as the elastic, elastic filament, otherwise referred to as titan protein. And the elastic filament is what gives the ability after the contraction and the relaxation, the titan pulls everything back like a spring to reset it. So we have thick filament in purple, we have thin filament in orange, and we have our elastic filament, otherwise known as titan, in green, that has a sort of a spring spiral corkscrew looking architecture to it. So after the contraction is done and it relaxes, 
it'll actually spring back to its resting position. So a couple of more of these kind of just identification pictures. Identification pictures. You can kind of appreciate from here to here is the sarcomere. This is a whole myofibril. We've got our Z-disc to Z-disc. You've got the I-band, just the thin filament only. You've got the H-band down the middle. You've got the A-band and then the M-line. Sarcomere, again, Z-disc to Z-disc. Functional contractile unit of muscle. From the Greek meaning flesh part. The muscles so, uh, shorten because these individual sar uh, sarcomeres shorten. And as the thick and the thin slide across each other, and we'll get into that Wednesday. But I want you to read ahead, okay? Because I want you to come prepared on that. So the Z discs are pulled closer and closer together as the thick and the thin filament slide past each other. It's important to note that the thick and the thin filament don't get any shorter in length or longer. They stay the same length, they just slide across each other, okay? Only the amount of overlap changes during a contraction event. Now you can appreciate at some point, there's no physical room for them to overlap anymore. You have crowding, right? And you can think through like, you can only contract a muscle so far, then it doesn't go anymore because there's a physical limitation at the microanatomy of how much these muscle fibers overlap. I'm sorry, how much these myofilaments overlap. Now, <clears throat> during the shortening that takes place, you have proteins that link, and we'll look at this picture here in a second, that link this whole structure, they link it to the outside of the cell, to the extracellular matrix, because when they contract, they have to have something to pull on in order to generate force. Make sense? So the example that I would use here in Flagstaff is, you can generate plenty of force from your tires on the road, even when it's icy, if you can have good traction. You have some ability to grip the road, you can generate the force. But if you just spin, right, and you just contract these muscles with no linkage point, then you actually have a lot of different diseases, and we'll talk about muscular dystrophy as one of the most common. So the shortening dystrophin and linking proteins link all of this architecture to the outside of the cell, the extracellular proteins. And that transfers the full force, sorry, the pull force to the extracellular tissue like that tire on ice example. There's about eight proteins that are responsible for this, and there are deletions and diseases associated with each one of those, but the dystrophin protein is the most common, and that's the one that we'll actually study in our bonus opportunity. So what three myofilaments are found in the fibrils? Thick, thin, and elastic. Thick, thin, and elastic. The elastic doesn't get a lot of attention. We kind of just say in this class, and in most 200 level A and P classes, we say the elastic filament, which is made up primarily of titan protein, T-I-T-A-N, functions as like a rubber band. When the muscle contraction is done, the elastic filament helps it reset. It springs it back into its reset position. We spend most of our energy talking about thick and thin filaments, and that's what we're going to start doing now. So you can see a blow up on the upper right of the thick filament. It's a thick filament because it looks thicker under microanatomy. You can see it's got these globs on it, these like golf uh, driver head looking structures. We call those myosin heads. This is a 2D representation of a 3D structure. So that's a cylinder protein, like a rope. And those 
myosin head globules are all the way around it, not just on this side. Can you appreciate that? If you spun that, you would see the same exact myosin heads all the way around, 360 degrees. The thin filament is a helical structure. So it's a globulous actin that actually forms a helical protein. And it's made up of three total proteins, the thin filament. The red, which gives it its red rustic color here, is the actin protein. We call it G-actin, but that is the actin protein. And it is 90% of the proteinaceous material within the thin filament. That's why I said mostly actin. But there's two other important proteins. We have this long, whitish blue cylinder looking protein known as tropomyosin. And then we have another globular protein known as troponin. And troponin exists in a complex, but we're going to study it as one unit. In upper division classes in muscle physiology, you'll break down the troponin complex into its individual parts, but we're not going to get to that level of molecular detail. Okay? Actin, about 90% of the thin. Tropomyosin and troponin are the other two proteins. So we categorize these. Two of these proteins are contractile proteins. Myosin and actin. So the myosin, which includes the myosin head, and the orange protein down here, which is known as the actin. Those are contractile proteins. The regulatory proteins are troponin and tropomyosin. Because in a different picture, in the future, you're going to see this white cylinder, blue cylinder-looking protein, tropomyosin, moving away from where it is positionally and revealing behind it a binding site. A binding site for these globular heads that want to find that binding site, but tropomyosin is in the way. It regulates whether or not the myosin head sees the binding site on the actin molecule. Hold that thought. We'll come back to that more and more on Wednesday. The troponin complex is another regulatory protein because it binds calcium and releases calcium. And calcium regulates whether or not muscle contraction is going to happen. Okay, so just a preview. Calcium will bind to troponin. That'll cause a conformational change of the troponin molecule. As it, what, what does that mean? It's like I'm catching a ball. I catch the ball. My body shape goes from here to here. That's the conformational change. Does that make sense? If there was some rope attached to me, like, some, like I'm wearing like a collar, and I go like this, the rope pulls. Does that make sense? So calcium is the ball. I grab the ball. I, I, I basket it, and then I'm going to start running. So I go through a conformational change from here to here. That rope is attached to another protein, tropomyosin, and it tugs on tropomyosin and moves it out of the way when calcium binds. Make sense? Calcium detaches, right? I let go of the calcium. I come back up like this. The tropomyosin that's attached to the linkage, the rope, with a leash around my neck, slides that protein back into blocking the binding site. Does that make sense? So that's essentially the concept that we're going to talk about on Wednesday. Contractile and regulatory proteins. So I told you about calcium. I told you it binds to troponin, right? That's that conformational change as you, as you capture it. Where do you get the calcium from? Where does the calcium come from? Anybody read ahead? Anybody look at the lecture ahead of time? Sarcoplasm reticulum. So we've got three structures here that have something to do with calcium availability inside the muscle cell. Because remember, where in the world are we? We're 
here at the level of the myofilaments, right? So if we're at the level of the myofilaments, that's these guys blown up, but we're way down here. How do we get calcium to the inner part of the cell? The sarcoplasmic reticulum is a modified structure. It's smooth endoplasmic reticulum from a regular cell, smooth ER. It's been modified to be a storage facility inside the cell to store calcium, okay? And you can kind of appreciate this sort of spiderweb looking blue structure, which is the SR or the sarcoplasmic reticulum. <clears throat> so it's bags of calcium, because remember, this is the plasma membrane, also referred to as the sarcolemma. We've peeled it back so you can actually appreciate what's just beneath the surface. Just beneath the surface is this elaborate architecture. And can you see the blue architecture that's here as well? It completely permeates the entire inside of the cell. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is this meshwork, smooth endoplasmic reticulum that permeates the inside of the cell because inside of it is calcium. So if it wants to release calcium, it can release it locally right next to where the myofibrils are. Make sense? Okay. Now I want you to look at a structure we refer to as the triad. The triad exists of sort of, well, you would think three, but it's kind of two of the same thing because you have terminal cisternae on either side of the purple middle part, which is called the transverse tubule. So it's a triad because you have two terminal cisternae and in the middle is the T-tubule or transverse tubule, abbreviated T-tubule. The terminal cisternae literally means the end tank the end tank of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, remember last week when I kind of told you there are a lot of words that we use that normal people don't use? This is one of those lectures, <laughs> okay? I mean, listen to what I'm saying. The sarcolemma, you peel that back. That's not a real word, right? Beneath it is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's not a real word to anybody else. At the end of the sarcoplasmic reticulum are structures known as the terminal cisternae. Let me translate. That's the end tank. It's the end area of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a little larger, that houses a vast majority of the calcium. And then it's in proximity to this T-tubule that I'll tell you in a second what it does. On the other side of that other T-tubule is another terminal cisternae, and then that microarchitecture continues. You follow? If you look a little proximal here, you can see these little holes. These are openings or holes into the transverse tubules or T-tubules. They're called T-tubules because when the action potential comes down the plasma membrane from a transmembrane signal, right? You have an action potential coming down the membrane, transmembrane signal, it gets to the hole, it takes a right turn and dives into the muscle cell down this right angle, which is the transverse tubule. That transverse tubule takes that electrical signal into the cell. So it's not just at the surface, it's actually into the cell where your myofibrils are. Make sense? So Two terminal cisternae and a transverse tubule are called a triad. Three structures. Two of the same thing on either side with a T-tubule in the middle. Make sense? Now, if I told you when you send an action potential from a nerve, it innervates, it goes down a transmembrane potential, otherwise known as an action potential, down the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber, or the muscle cell, into the transverse tubule next to 
the terminal cisternae that house calcium, what if I told you that electrical signal opens a calcium gate to allow calcium to flow? The calcium then can find the troponin complex, binds the troponin, conformational change, the tropomyosin moves out of the way, myosin head finds the actin molecule. Make sense? That's a lot. That's a, we're going to go over that again a few times. Not just today, but we'll do it on Wednesday, we'll do it on Monday. Because that, friends, is the whole cycle of how this works. Okay? Do you understand why this microarchitecture is so important for that? It can't be a typical, you know, round cell with a nucleus in the middle. <laughs> right? Like the classic central dogma cell that you draw, which is like a circle, like a blob circle, circle with a smaller circle that you, you know, color in. This is a very specialized cell. Okay, let's talk about myofilaments. I had mentioned this when we were talking about dystrophin or dystrophin, but there's about seven to nine accessory proteins <clears throat> that link this architecture to the outside of the cell. So here's the sarcolemma. Surprise, surprise, it looks exactly like a phospholipid bilayer because that's what it is. It's just a cell membrane. This is a transmembrane protein like we studied in the first unit. And this is our link, these are linking proteins that link to dis, uh, dystrophin or dystrophin that links to actin. So when these guys slide, they pull through the membrane of the cell to the outside of the cell to generate force. You have to have something to pull on, right? Or, or no, for, no force actually happens. So <clears throat> they anchor the myofilaments, regulate the length of the, length of the myofilaments, and help for optimal alignment for contractile of effectiveness. So shouldn't it be surprising if you have a defect in any of these linking proteins you don't contract your muscles efficiently. And that's what happens with the number one most clinically relevant uh, dystrophin or dystrophin. It links actin to the outermost myofilaments, to transmembrane proteins, to allow force to actually happen. And we'll study in, in our, our um, bonus opportunity effect in dystrophin that creates this muscle, muscle, mus, muscular dystrophy disease. So muscular dystrophy, it's a hereditary disease where the skull of the muscle degenerates and weakens over time. And in replacement is adipose tissue and scarring. Because you're, you're doing a lot of pulling, but you're not pulling on the right thing, and so it creates cellular trauma and you get scarring. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy is caused by a sex-linked recessive trait. One out of 3,600 live-born boys is the most common form. This is a male disease um, because it tends to be recessively X-linked. It can exist in females, but it's rare. Um, diagnosed between 2 and 10 years of age, and the mutation in the gene for dystrophin is the culprit. That's the red linking protein right here. Average life expectancy is not high. Average of 25 years of age. Usually, because important skeletal muscle for respirations and cardiac muscle, which is organized in the very same way, have a lot of scarring and a lot of inf insufficiency in those, so there's either respiratory failure or cardiovascular failure. Okay. Questions? Yeah. So the question on muscular dystrophy uh, is the respiratory and cardiac failure sudden? Well, at the end it is, but usually there's a decline that takes place. And there's a lot of interventions that can be done. 
um, to try to you know, extend life and improve the quality of life for the patient. Um, but you know, again, I, I think you'll find some of the research interesting. Um, there, there's a, a lot to be discovered in this space, right? There's a lot to be discovered in this space. Other questions? Okay, so let's now look at this connection between what we refer to as the nerve and the muscle. In that connection, we affectionately term the neuromuscular junction, NMJ. You'll find that scientists are not that creative sometimes, right? Scientists and engineers are not great marketing people. We have a nerve, we have a muscle, they come together in a junction, what should we call it? How about the neuromuscular junction? That sounds brilliant. We should make an easier term for people to remember. How about the NMJ? I like it, let's do that. Because WD-40 is already taken. Okay. Skeletal muscle never contracts unless it's stimulated by a nerve. This is the main reason I prefer, which is a little atypical, but I prefer to cover muscle out of sequence from lab, out of sequence from most textbooks, but I think it makes a little bit more sense to cover muscle contraction after you've talked about nerve physiology. Now, you can do it the other way around, and most everybody in the world does it that way, but this is, this is kind of the reason that I, I, I choose to do it this way, is it never contracts unless it's stimulated by a nerve. So if the nerve connections are cut, severed, or poisoned, they won't fire. The muscle won't fire. It's paralyzed. And so denervation, atrophy, is when you have shrinkage of the muscle or atrophy of the muscle. That's what that word means. When a nerve connection is not present or it's not restored. So let's talk a little bit about how nerves and muscles like find each other or innervate on each other. <clears throat> You've got somatic motor neurons. Those are nerve cells that cell bodies are in the brain stem and spinal cord, and they serve skeletal muscles. Then we have, it, it, that term should be familiar, right? We have somatic motor fibers. These axons that lead to skeletal muscle, they're nerve fibers that branch out to a number of different muscle fibers and each muscle fiber is supplied by a motor neuron. So here's the picture. You got a spinal cord prep that should look familiar. You can see this is out the ventral side, so it's motor efferent pathways, which all should make sense, right? This is why this class is cumulative, right? Because this, this should be making sense. Like you look at this picture and you're like, okay, I've seen that before. Maybe you missed a test question on it, but now you remember. Well, we've got motor neuron number one in red, hitting red muscle fibers or muscle cells. Motor neuron number two, which are blue uh, colored, and there's neuromuscular junction on each of those connections. And this is sort of the motif that your body utilizes, where you've got one nerve that feeds many muscle fibers. It's more efficient that way. Right? Muscle fibers of one motor uh, unit, it's dispersed throughout the muscle. They contract in unison. Like all the blue muscle cells are going to contract at the same time. All the red ones are going to contract at the same time. Can you tell the blue and red to contract at the same time? Yes. Could you tell just the blues to contract? Yeah. So when I pick up this, I just use the blues. When I need to pick up this, I use the blue and the reds because I'm recruiting more muscle fibers based upon the size and the weight of the object, right? So you're not like every time you go, you're not robotically going, whoa, right? Like, let's do a pointer, right? Like, way to go, and you like pat somebody on the back, right? You shake somebody's hand, it's nice and you know, firm but gentle, right? But you wanna arm wrestle them, it's different. So that's how you recruit different forces by recruiting these motor uh, units based upon what your sensory information is telling you. So you can contract them in unison, produce a weak contraction over a wide area. You can sustain long contractions. You can effectively contract 
using several motor units at once. So if we look at you know, basically how this breaks down, motor neurons and motor units, on average in the body, on average, it's 200 muscle fibers for each motor unit. But there are some extreme examples that I would like you to know for the exam. I'd like you to know if I define it as a small motor unit, that's for fine degree of control, right? That's for picking up a pen. A small motor unit is used for fine degree of control, like writing something. In the old days, we did this instead of this, okay? But this is still small motor units. And some of you are amazing. I watch you and you're like, right? Three to six muscle fibers per neuron. Hand and eye muscles fall into small motor unit definition. Large motor unit, more strength than control. Think of like powerful contractions, like your leg muscles, your back muscles, even your arm muscles. So the gastrocnemius has a thousand muscle fibers per neuron, for example. The gastroc is where? And you're like, you said you wouldn't ask that question, Keller. <laughs> Fair. That's the calf muscle, okay? So, yes, on the exam, you're like, I don't remember where the gastroc is. Okay, fine. I'll tell you where the gastroc is. That was lab that was asking about those, okay? I want you to understand the calf muscle is a big muscle, right? The hamstrings, the quadriceps, those are large motor units. So, you're favoring power or force over control. The neuromuscular junction, this is the location <clears throat> where the nerve fiber meets its target cell, the NMJ. You've got a terminal branch of the nerve fiber that forms a synapse with the muscle fiber. I'm going to show you a picture in a second. And this nerve fiber stimulates that muscle fiber at several points in the neuromuscular junction, not just at one location. So here is another figure to study. An important figure to understand. What is this down here? What is this down here? We just talked about it for most of lecture. What is it? It's a muscle cell, otherwise known as what? A muscle, a muscle fiber. I'm trying to say that a lot because I know someone on the exams go, oh my gosh, I have no idea what a muscle fiber is. Is that like part of the cell, like the fiber part? Right? No, muscle fiber, muscle cell, same, same terminology, right? So let's, let's use all the vocabulary we can. We've got nucleus, it's multinucleated, we got our mitochondria. We see the sarcolemma has these invaginations or these folds. We call those junctional folds. Inserted in those are acetylcholine receptors in purple. Conveniently, you have the folding of the membrane to do what, class? What's the purpose of that? Increased surface area, right? Some of the answers are the same answers. Increased surface area because on the presynaptic side, look at this. This is a motor neuron, I'm sorry, a motor nerve fiber um, that is myelinated. And that myelin actually covers the entire neuromuscular junction. These structures are synaptic vessels that contain acetylcholine, ACH. Now, what type of receptor is this acetylcholine receptor from last week? What kind of receptor is it? Remember? Is it adrenergic or cholinergic? Cholinergic, why? What type of cholinergic do you think if you subtyped it? If it binds acetylcholine, it's nicotinic. This is excited by acetylcholine. It's a nicotinic cholinergic receptor. Acetylcholine, this action potential is going to come here. It's going to trigger acetylcholine to release into this gap. It's going to bind to its receptor on the other side, and it's going to propagate an action potential to continue down the sarcoplasm. Make sense? So the synaptic knob, 
That's the swollen end of the nerve fiber. That's this part right here, this bulge part of the nerve fiber. Contain, contains those synaptic vesicles that are filled with acetylcholine. Why don't you, why do you even bother, Dr. Keller? Why, why, that seems like a lot of energy. Why don't you just like put some wiring across, right? That would be easier. Why do we go through all this trouble of having this knob, acetylcholine in, in, in vesicles that come across, bind, then there's like 17 more things you can ask me about. Why don't we just remodel, remodel the bathroom and make this easy? I mean, why? What's the purpose? Any ideas? Well, you can, you can control this. You can regulate when the muscle fiber fires. You can regulate how hard it fibers. How, how hard it fires, how aggressive, how many acetylcholines do you release? How long do they stay in the cleft to stimulate the other side? So this tiny gap between the knob and the muscle sarcolemma, between the synaptic knob and the muscle plasma membrane. It's another name for sarcolemma. The Schwann cell envelops and isolates the neuromuscular junction. See this basal lamina? from everything else. So this junction has these synaptic vesicles that go through exocytosis as they dump their contents into the cleft. More than 50 million acetylcholine receptors are found in the body. And these junctional folds increase that surface area like we talked about for those receptors. And if you have a lack of those receptors, you have a disease of paralysis known as myasthenia gravis. That's the lack of those functional acetylcholine receptors. This basal lamina is that extension of the Schwann cell that keeps the acetylcholine in the cleft. Now, when the acetylcholine is done in that cleft, you use an enzyme, you know it's an enzyme because it ends in ACE, acetylcholine esterase, which is abbreviated ACHE, that breaks down after contraction, causing relaxation. Couple of pictures that I wanna show you of just this, some diagrams. Here's our muscle fiber striated. Here is a neuromuscular junction. Do you see that? Neuromuscular junction. I think this is a really important picture to understand because it, it shows everything that we've been talking about. This picture right here. It shows it all. Let me highlight it. Right? We've got a neuromuscular junction. We refer to that on the other side is the motor end plate, the other side of that synapse, because that's where the activity is going to happen. Here we've got the axons of the motor nerves. These are efferent or afferent? Motor nerves. Efferent or afferent? Efferent, very good. Here's our skeletal muscle cell or our skeletal muscle fiber. Couple more pretty pictures as we wrap it up. Here's the primary synaptic cleft. Here's our synaptic vesicles, all in blue. Do you see all of the acetylcholine in them? Here are the second, we call these secondary synaptic clefts because they've got these junctional folds. That's where the extra acetylcholine receptors are found. And then the synaptic terminal is a very busy area, so it has a lot of mitochondria. Okay, last pretty picture, and then stick around. Don't leave quite yet. Skeletal muscle fiber. What is this white space? Those are the folds. This is the mitochondria on the presynaptic side. A lot of energy is necessary, a lot of ATP. Here's our cleft. Here's our junctional folds, more of the synaptic vesicles. This is where we'll pick it up on Wednesday, but I got one more thing for you.